in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. So you could read it like that. Um, but John intentionally picks the word uh, logos, which is word, and I think that he does this on purpose because he wants us to understand a little bit more about Jesus than just that he is Jesus. And so John is also using this word in the sense of God's word in action. God's word in action. You see, um, one commentator, he put it this way. He said, words are a type of action, and actions are a kind of words. Right? That, that makes sense, right? Especially when we think about God in the Old Testament. Uh, when God said something, it was done, right? Actually, Derek, would you turn around real quick on your shirt? Everybody look at Derek's shirt on the back. It says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light, right? So God's word was also an action. God said, let there be light, and there was light. But then also when we think about it in, in the opposite way, um, we think of it like a different Old Testament story where, where maybe God didn't say something, but he did something, right? God uh, bringing down the plagues to, to, to Egypt to, to free his people and, and parting the Red Sea and providing them with manna and quail and water in the desert. God didn't have to say anything in each of those instances. He just did something. But in doing something, he's saying a lot, right? And so if we think about both of these things, God's word in action, God's word in action. And so that's part of the, the understanding of the word logos that we need to understand here. And so he's saying that, that Jesus is God's word in action. And so we go back and we see that before the creation, before creation, the word was there, right? In the beginning was the word, or in the beginning was Jesus. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Um, we don't have time to jump into this super deeply, but one thing to note here is that you see um, it says, in the beginning was, was the word, and the word was with God. And so there's a plural distinction here. So word was with God. So there's a separation, a, a distinction there. But then in the very next clause, it says, and the word was God. So that's where we see a oneness. And so this is kind of, this is one of the foundational uh, verses to the doctrine of the Trinity. And, and when we think about this, when we think, okay, why would John make it so clear that, that there's a, a, a distinction between Jesus and God, but also a oneness? Well, when we read through the rest of the story of, of the book of John, we might get confused when Jesus um, says something like, I and the Father are one, right? When he says, I and the Father are one, we might say, wait, how, how are they one? And then we go back and we see, oh, and the word was God. So Jesus is saying, I am God. Or, or when we look at uh, the story of Jesus being baptized in, in the Jordan River, uh, we see God the Father there saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. We see Jesus the Son, who is God, and we see the Holy Spirit coming down like a dove. And we might say, wait, how, how is that possible? How, how are all three persons of the Trinity there at, at once? And we go back and we say, oh, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so John is building the foundation to the way that we are going to read the rest of the book. When we read these stories about Jesus, we're going to go back to the prologue and say, oh, this is why he said this. This is why he made this so clear. This oneness distinction, or this oneness, but also distinction of the, the, the Trinity and the Godhead. Moving on into verse 3, and there's a lot more we could say about that. There could be whole sermons about that, but we got to move on. Our, our purpose is to understand what John wants us to know, to understand about Jesus and his actions in the rest of the book. So verse 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Um, can I get those two verses up, uh, Hebrews 1, 2, and Psalm 33, 6? So this, re this reminds us of, of passages like this. Um, I don't know what the first part is. Hath at the end of these days spoken unto, <laughs> unto us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So that's Hebrews 1, 2. And then the next one. By the word of Jehovah were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And so uh, focus in on by the word of Jehovah. And then Jesus is referenced here as the word, right? And so this, this, passage remi uh, this verse reminds us of passages like this. Um, one commentator put it this way. God is the creator, and the word is his agent. Moving on into verses 4 and 5, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Um, yet again, John kind of looks back to Genesis, and, and 
begs us to think about how God separated the light from the darkness, right? He, he's, he cre created the light, and there was a separation between the light and the darkness. And so in this sense, there is also kind of a spiritual separation between light and darkness. And John says, in Jesus, in the word, was life, and that life was the light of men. He says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You see, Jesus is God's mode of banishing the spiritual darkness of sin and unbelief. Without the light of Christ, the world would be in utter darkness. And so John uses this imagery of life, light and darkness and, and life and death a lot in his writing. And so, again, when we, when we see this in future passages, we go back and, and we're like, okay, what's he talking about, light, light and darkness, right? With, you know, is he using this, like, metaphorically, or is he using this, like, in just a purely physical light and darkness sense? Well, we go back and we see, okay, the word is Jesus, and the word has life and light in him, and the light shines in the darkness. So when John is talking about light and darkness... He's talking about, about the light of Jesus and then the darkness of sin, right? And so one of the things that I really think is really cool about this, this verse is he says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Um, Nicholas, if you could turn off that light for just a second. Next one. Okay, so it's pretty dark, but look at that. There's a couple phones on right now. And then we do this. One, one little phone light shines a lot, right? All right, put, put that back on. It might have been still kind of dark, but it wasn't totally dark. You could have gotten up and walked around, might have bumped into somebody. But the, the point is that, that light and darkness are opposites, but they're not opposites of equal power. It could be so, so just deafening dark, right? You guys have probably been in a situation where it was just so dark, it was like scary, eerily dark, right? But one little like match, one little phone light can dispel a lot of darkness, and so that's what John is saying here. Uh, the darkness will fight against Jesus, will fight against the, the light of Jesus, but it will not overcome it because they're opposites but not opposites of equal power. Moving on into our next section, we'll look at verse 6. It says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. Um, so it's interesting here that John, uh, John, the son of Zebedee, the writer uh, of the book, uh, does not refer to John, this John as John the Baptist. Um, and the reason for this is because in John's view, John the Baptist's uh, main purpose was not preaching repentance or, um, or administering baptism, but it was to be a witness to Jesus. And so that's how he kind of looks at John the Baptist. And so he says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. So we see that John is a witness to the light. His purpose is essentially the same as uh, John, the son of Zebedee, the writer of this book. His purpose, John the Baptist's purpose, was so to shine or to, to show the light of Jesus so that others would believe in him, so that all may believe in him. In verse 8, we see again that John was not the light, only bearing witness to the light. Could I get uh, the, the John chapter 5, 35 verse up here? Um, Jesus refers to John later as a lamp, um, in, in, later in, in the book, in John chapter 5, 35, he says, he was the lamp that burneth and shineth, and ye, and ye were willing to rejoice for a season in his light. Um, can we do the ESV next time instead of like ye and they? I'm not good at yees and theys and thous and stuff. <laughs> um, so we see that John is a witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. So this kind of begs the question for all believers is how are we a witness to the light? How are we a witness to Jesus? John was a lamp, right? A lamp is not the light, but it, it maybe produces the light or it shows the light, it carries the light, but it is not the light. And so that kind of begs the question, and we won't linger on this, but, but think about it for yourself. How are you a lamp that, that shines the light of Jesus Christ? And when you are shining the light of Jesus Christ, are you doing it in a prideful way? Are you doing it for um, ill-gotten gain or, or something like that? But how can we imitate John the Baptist and be a lamp that simply uses what God has given us to point back to Jesus? Verses 9 and 10. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. 
But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So John here now refers to Jesus as coming to his own people, but they didn't, they didn't know him. They didn't, they didn't accept him, right? And, and obviously some people accepted him, but as a whole, um, his own people, right, the Jews, did not accept him. Um, they did not accept him as, as, as their coming Messiah. And so, again, John is telling us something that is crucial that we need to know for the rest of the book. Because we know that the Old Testament has been building and building and building to the coming Messiah, right? But then when Jesus comes, his people don't see him. They don't recognize him. They don't accept him. And so when we look at stories in the book of John where, where his own people don't acknowledge him, we're like, why, don't, why won't they acknowledge him? Then we, we go back to the prologue and we say, oh, John told us that they wouldn't acknowledge him, that they wouldn't accept him. But of course, some did accept him. And in verse 12, John says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is also important because if you were, especially if you were a Jewish writer or a reader, and you're reading the book of John, and, and you see maybe a story where Jesus um, is talking to um, the Samaritan woman at the well, right? You might be like, oh, whoa, 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 Jesus, she's a Samaritan woman. She is not a descendant of Abraham, like maybe a tiny bit, but it's intermixed, and she is not a descendant of Abraham. She is not part of our people. But wait, John told us that it's not by blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so John, again, is about whether our parents were Christian, that it's not about your bloodlines. It's not about your family history. Um, For us today, it's not about whether our parents were Christians or our grandparents are Christians. It's about whether we personally have put our faith in Jesus Christ. And those people, us, we will become children of God. Moving on into kind of our next section, verses 14 through 18. Verse 14 is one of the most important verses in this passage, one of the most important in the Bible. Um, John doesn't really uh, let us know who the word is until really this section here. Um, But we know it's Jesus. Um, But then in verse 14 it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And so we've already been referring to the word as Jesus and kind of using them interchangeably for our purposes. Um, But this is the point where John makes this abundantly clear. The word Jesus, the, the, the eternal Jesus God, now becomes a man, now takes on flesh, becomes a man. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we see that Jesus, eternity past, God becomes a man in verse 14. Now, uh, most of your passages probably say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, dwelt. Um, But some other passages will say, and set up his tabernacle among us. Anybody's version say that by chance? Um, I don't remember which one it is. But some will say, set up his tabernacle among us. And and I really like the, uh, the imagery behind that, because what was the purpose of the tabernacle? It was... It was so that God could dwell with his people, right? When, when they came uh, out of Egypt and they were wandering in the desert, um, the reason God gave them the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and how all these really specific rules and stuff was so that God could dwell with his people. Though in this, in terms of, of Jesus setting up his tabernacle among his people, think about how significant that is. God is coming down, becoming a man to be with his people, and before, there was all of these rules and the setting up the tent and don't touch the tabernacle and cleanliness and uncleanliness and all these things. But now Jesus has just come as a man. He's humbled himself to be with his people. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Um, so I want to kind of hearken us back again to Exodus. If we could pull up Exodus chapter 34, verse 5. Um, so this same glory that Jesus, that, that, that people saw in Jesus, um, is the same glory that, that Moses, um, saw or saw part of in Exodus. Exodus 34 verse 5 says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You see, that's how God introduced himself to the people of the Old Testament. That's how God introduced himself to Moses. He said, He said, I'm gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And now Jesus is introducing himself in human form, the grace and truth among us, 
seen his glory, glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's a shorter description, but it's about the same. Grace and truth, steadfast love and faithfulness. These are attributes of God. And the glory of Jesus, the incarnate word, is the same glory uh, that, that Moses saw a part of. That was the story, actually, it's, that, that passage is right after God put his hand over the cleft in the rock and, and passed over Moses. And then Moses was all glowing and everything, and people were like, oh, Moses is glowing. And they were scared of him and stuff. Um, but it was all because he had seen a little bit of the glory of God. So this is the same glory that Jesus had when he became a man. Moving on into verse 15, it says, John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Now, I think that this verse is kind of interesting uh, because if anybody knew uh, Jesus and, and John the Baptist, they would know that um, their mothers were cousins of some sort. There's some sort of relation there. Um, and that John the Baptist was actually physically born before Jesus was. But John is acknowledging here that, that Jesus is ranks before him because he was before him. So uh, even though Jesus was born after John into his uh, humanity, uh, God, uh, John, John the Baptist is acknowledging that Jesus is, is eternal, that he is God, that he is before all things even created. Verse 16, for from, him, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Um, grace upon grace is received through Jesus Christ. Through no one else can we receive grace. Um, I think that the, the term grace upon grace is, is really just kind of similar to what Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians, where he said, uh, where he's talking about his trials and, and his temptations and whatnot, and, and he said, you know, God's grace is sufficient for me. And as a believer, God's grace is sufficient for us. Um, there's, no, there, there's nothing else that we need. There's no extra grace. There's nothing that we have to do to earn more grace. Uh, the grace that Jesus Christ has provided through his sacrifice on the cross is sufficient for us. It is grace upon grace. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Um, so basically what John is doing here in this verse is he's just, he's just saying that he's just putting the old order and the new order kind of in contrast. And he's showing that, that Jesus, Jesus and the new order is just um, a fuller sense, a, a more supreme version, I guess, of the old order. And he says, uh, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So Moses and Jesus have something in common. They're both mediators between God's people and God. Uh, Moses was the one who got the Ten Commandments up on Mount Sinai. He came down and he relayed them to the people. People disobeyed. He goes back up. He talks to God. He says, please don't kill them. God says, okay, I'll relent. He comes down. He's like, hey, he's not going to kill you. That sort of thing. Um, Jesus is also our mediator between God and us. But the difference is that uh, Moses did not embody the law of God. He did not embody the grace of God. He did not embody the truth of of God. But Jesus, being God, didn't just bring the word of God, didn't just bring a message from God, but he also embodied the grace and truth of God because he is God and these are attributes of him. These are attributes of his nature. They're central to who Jesus is, the God of grace and truth. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So that's the end of our, our passage for the night. Um, and so what do we take from all of this? It's a lot of, of, of deep and, and mostly doctrinal, um, theological kind of a passage. But I think the point of this introductory passage, for, for us tonight at least, is, is that the rest of this book is about God becoming man, being a light to the world, having life in him. There was a man named John who was a, who was a witness about him. We are supposed to also be witnesses to God, and that this Jesus, the God-man, became, became a man. He put on flesh. He came to this earth, and then he died on the cross for our sins, and that's, that's kind of the point. It's, it's actually the gospel, right, and we have a chance to, to put our faith in Jesus Christ and share, uh, and, and share in his salvation and be resurrected with him in new life. So for those of us who, who believe in Jesus, we will be granted salvation as children of God. Um, for any of you in the room tonight who maybe have not believed in Jesus Christ, um, the message for you is that God became a man and humbled himself and, and, and died even though he was God um, in place of our sins. So that all of us who put faith in him 
can, can receive salvation. Uh, one commentator said about the book of John, he said, it's shallow enough that a baby can wade, um, but it's, it's deep enough that an elephant can swim. Um, and that's kind of true of the book of John. Um, it, it's, not, it's not super hard to understand, it, but it's also very in-depth if you want to be. And that's really true of the gospel as well. Um, the gospel is, is deep enough in the mysteries of God and how he is related to us. Those mysteries are, are deep enough that, that the greatest minds in the world could study the Bible and God and who he is and still not truly comprehend it all for a lifetime. But the gospel is also simplistic enough that we don't have to know a lot about the Bible. We don't have to, to be experts in biblical languages to understand what Jesus has done for us. We don't have to be experts in the Bible. Honestly, we don't even have to read the Bible from cover to cover to know that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and that those of us who put our faith in him can have salvation through him. And for those of us who, who have faith in Jesus, I think our application might be uh, just a little bit different because we've already taken that step of faith. We believe in Jesus. We know that he's God. We know that he became a man and that he walked through this earth as a physical human and then he died on the cross for our sins, and we put our faith in him and the fact that, that he paid the price for our sins so that we didn't have to. So we've already taken that step. And so I think one of the, one of the really cool kind of applications from this passage is, is to imitate John the Baptist. He was a lamp that illuminated a dark world with the light of Jesus Christ. When people were asking him who he was, he was like, I'm just a voice that cries out in the darkness. I'm just a, a voice uh, paving the way, ready to raise him, basically what he was saying. He wasn't drawing any attention to himself. Um, pe people were ready to raise him up as like the next big prophet, but he was like, no, it's, it's just, it's all about Jesus. And so when we think of this idea of the light um, illuminating the darkness, we may think that the darkness is, is overwhelming sometimes, um, the darkness of sin, um, the darkness of unbelief, the darkness of this world. We may look around us and, and, and see all the sin in the world, and we may read the news and, and, and get really discouraged because it's just all bad, bad, bad. There's bad things happening, and there's bad people doing bad things. And then we look into our own hearts, and we realize that we're sinful people too. And we do bad things. We don't always have a heart for God. But that's what gives us the need for a Savior. Jesus paid the price on the cross for the sins of the world, but also for our sins as well. And so I think an easy application for us is that we can illuminate the world with the light of the word made flesh, the God-man Jesus who came so that we might have grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. And Lord, we thank you for the book of John. We thank you that you were with him, that your Holy Spirit was with him as he was writing these things down, as he was penning them, and that that saved wrote down all of the necessary things that we need to know about Jesus in order to be saved and in order to obey you. We thank you that your word is complete and perfect. And God, we also thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross for our sins, even though you didn't have to do it. And we thank you that you've given us uh, the ability to have salvation and new life through you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.